February is Black History Month, and this is an opportunity that we want to give to you all to learn about great leaders that have come about in Black agriculture. Very few people know about these leaders, so this is the purpose and the reason that we're doing these videos so that you would know the great contributions that these uh, men and women have made in agriculture. Also, agriculture is significant in the black community, contributing over $200 million to the economy of the state of North Carolina. Many of these individuals on these videos, you will find that they've made many great firsts, and they have not received the recognition for those firsts. So this is an opportunity for you to not only learn, but also to give them recognition for their contribution that they've made to the number one industry in the state of North Carolina, and possibly the number one industry in the minority or the black community. So we hope you enjoy these videos, and more importantly, we hope you learn, and also that you will know more about the history of black farm agriculture. Thank you. Around the table, I have Dr. Antoine Austin, Associate Dean at North Carolina a &T. Dr. James West, the first County Operations Director for the Cooperative Extension Service. It might have been called the Agriculture Extension Service, <laughs> Dr. West, back then. Johnny Jones, first County Extension Director in Lenore and uh, Wake County. And Dr. Alton Thompson, who is former Dean at North Carolina a State University. We're going to jump right in on all four feet. Dr. West, who were some of your mentors or some of the leaders in the early uh, segregated extension service? Archie, that's a very interesting question because I came in at a period of time, 1965, when the decision was made to uh, sue a USDA along with University of Iowa at Chapel Hill. And those were kind of some turbulent times. And what I remember is I was one of the youngest members of that group, we call it the Progressive Club. We had uh, S.N. Shelton, who was a major leader out of Orange County. As many of you know, Carl Hodges was the first Black in extension services to be appointed as a county extension director. I guess you could say that a PE made was more the participant leader mm -hmm. of the group. Uh, we were all a team, we all worked together. And Elsie Cooker, P.T. McNeil, L.R. James, and we can't forget James Wright, Molly Bradley mm -hmm. out, out of Robinson County. Mm -hmm. I, think she, I think she was the first black to be elected as the head of the home economics program. I had had the opportunity to move up in the organization. I remember LC and, and P. Bade Moore said to me, said, you kind of lay low, said, you up there with powerful white folks. And uh, I said, well, I don't mind taking that chance. But they insisted that those shows the kind of people and their concern for others. He was a young guy on the block, so they were kind of protecting you. Exactly. Uh, they were, you, you were going to come along later, but that, and that's real, that's something we don't do a lot of times as black people. We don't, we don't take care of each other. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, honestly, I was scared that day. You know? <laughs> I was scared about a whole lot of things. But um, I thought about it. Somebody said, if you don't stand for something, you fall for anything. So I walked into the district court right there in, in Bali. Newman Avenue, and I couldn't figure out what I was going to run into. There were probably 200 people in that court, <laughs> and uh, Judge Dupree, the most uh, a racist judge anywhere in the country. So I walked in, I looked on the left, there was probably two or three spaces, and I looked on the right, and there wasn't many spaces either. One side was all black, and one side was all white. That symbolizes where we are. It's been very rewarding. I received the state agriculture award and a number of things. I'm like Dr. Barber. I'm not working on my title. 
Mm -hmm. I'm working on my testimony. Right. <laughs> and I can say that all was well in my soul. And I think that this experience that I've had, and especially to be in the midst of so, such great leaders and legends, I uh, served uh, at Mayor Pro Gym six executive terms to run uh, to be commissioner, and, uh, and I've had some great experiences, and finally, all the things I have done related to uh, being on the board of commissioners and a whole lot of stuff. Yes, is that I am the conscience of that board. And sometimes they don't like it, but that's the way it is. Well, you know, Dr. West, and I think that's a very important statement you made because there was a lot of extension people that ended up being uh, yeah. uh, public servants, you and uh, Wake County. I know we talked about A.P. Coleman down in Wilson County, uh, even Cedric Jones here uh, in uh, Franklin County. Um, uh, P.E. Bazemore, who uh, uh, filed the lawsuit. He was a uh, city councilman exactly. down in Monroe. Uh, so there were a lot of the black, uh, most of them from the black segregated extension went on after they retired to become uh, local uh, county commissioners, county uh, uh, city councilmen, mayors, uh, many of them uh, went on. Thank you again, Dr. West, for your service. Johnny, who were some of the people that mentored you? You weren't in the segregated system, but you were at the end of it. I've had the best of both worlds. One county continued to be mentioned here. One county, believe it or not, is at the forefront of extension. You had L.C. Cooper. I think R.E. Jones was from here. I had Leroy James and I had Bill Clayton, the late Bill Clayton. As far as leadership, Carl Hodges, S.N. Shelton, Fletcher Lasserson, Dan Goffrey, yes. Percy Williams from Luther City, Dr. James West here, uh, Chester Stock from Kinston, Clifton Grimes, P.E. Baysmore, L.C. Cooper, I mentioned before, Clyde Chisney. Mm. Uh, I've had some awful good road lines. Wow. Before segregation, you had Black County Extension Director and White County Extension Director, but then when it changed, the whites were still getting paid here yes, and the blacks were getting paid down there. And see, when the guy did a uh, competition of salary disparities, all the high salary was dead folks. And so, you know, that's, that's, that's bad record keeping, but my point <laughs> being, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was. <laughs> we didn't take our eyes off the prize of helping people. Right. Helping them, starting where they are, and helping them up. And as I say continuously, all life is about, watch what I'm saying now, is the gap between what is and what ought to be. We spend our whole lifetime in trying to close that gap. When you got matching funds like Smith Label Act, you got to have matching funds. Well, the states had to match the funds. So many times we couldn't use the funds because they wouldn't match them. Right. And what ENT got was what NC State said they would have. <laughs> and see, we fought, I fought a long time. I was at on care when at least we got the state to chip in. Right. A lot of people don't even realize that was a milestone. It was. I've been around the horn, like I said, I've had awful good mentors. And, and thanks to Archie, I've been on the Carrot Board. Uh, now I'm on the Farmland Preservation Board and uh, Farm Finance. Yeah, egg finance. But now, I was saw like West. I was young and they were pushing me. They, they saw more of me than I saw in myself. And they wouldn't let me go astray. They would say, Johnny, you need to apply for this job. You need to do this and so. And I pride myself on all the counties I work, every agent got a master's degree, most of them. Then they went on to get PhD degree. But uh, I, I guess I've had good mentorship, and all these persons gave me a different perspective of life. Frank Henry, Dr. West, uh, Mr. What was his name? Boston down in Lewis. Yeah. So, but see, I started out with soil conservation, traveled the state, and then in the military, I traveled the world. I had grown as an individual. County agent Fletcher Bible, S.N. Shelton. Uh, I just, every day, I almost get emotional because mm. when I first went to ANT, Dr. Dunn, Fountain, Bell, and all these guys. 
And, and, and then even they got a sense of humanity. I said, well, I'm like, hey, but what I need humanity. But the older you get, you can understand Maslow's hierarchy of need. You see, some of us never get up to this triangle. We're still down here. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? But life is sweet, but it's what you make it. Yeah. And I still say the extension is the best way I've kept secret to have taught people. We've got their feet out of the market site. We've got them out of the mud Educate. Yeah. All right. And I'm so thankful to be a part of this esteemed group here today. Well, Johnny, thank you so much. And uh, you talked about J.W. Mitchell. J.W. Mitchell has a the first black to have a 4-H camp. Yeah, and it's where the black was it was yeah. it J.W. Mitchell where all the black four inches had to go. What's the what's the yeah, yeah, Mitchell? It was FFA. 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 New farmers though, man. Right. Then they changed the future farmers. Right. But my point being, we would take the back of bones and take the school and then they would sell it. This is what kept a lot of other families on. Mm -hmm. But see, there's a lot of history. The Black Teachers Association had had a camp down there. It's be Simmons. It's be Simmons. We're talking about right. Okay. But, but, but say there's a lot of history. See, and this is the beauty of what we're doing here. Folks, we've got so much history. We need to stick our chest out every day. But when I used to have my meeting with my father, they come dragging in. I said, look, I know you've been down so long that getting up never crossed your mind. But now if you're not here tonight to listen and get some pocketbook issues, you need to go back home and watch Monday Night Football. <laughs> Well, John, we thank you for that call. And J.W. Mitchell, I think one of the first uh, state agents, and he eventually was hired by USDA. His, his book is over. I got okay. the book over there. Well, we got the book. Dr. Thompson, give us a, a little bit of the disparities between funding between 1890s and 1862 as you saw it in your role as dean. I'm just in here uh, going down memory lane. Reflective on the comments that uh, Dr. West said, I uh, brought about a lot of memories. Thinking about what Johnny Jones said, brought a lot of memories, a lot of emotions too. And then looking across the table at Dr. Austin, who was my freshman work study student. Hey, how old I am and seasoned. But as you know, North Carolina Atlanta State University started at Shaw University as a room. Because uh, the white persons of the state said that we couldn't be on North Carolina State's campus. We want the money. We want the land grant money, but you're not going to be here. So they put, up, put us at Shaw. Then we saw the light <laughs> and moved to Greensboro. Because <laughs> some um, good African-Americans at Greensboro gave us some land. The other thing is, 1890 land grant started without land, except for Alcorn. Mm -hmm. All the other 1890s started without land, so we were landless university for land grant. It started because in 1890, the 1862 university wanted more money. So just tomorrow, I'll say, if we're going to give you more money, if you set up self institutions for African Americans or let them come to your universities. And most of the Southern and Border states said no. Uh -uh. We're going to take the money, but you set up your separate universities. That's why AT started for NC State, moved to Shaw in 1890. But NC State was getting the money. Because of the white 82 you needed more money, it started 1890 more or less. So that's when you start getting a little money less than a couple thousand dollars per school. And then as Archer said, when the Hatch Act came in 1887, uh, 90 years later, that's when the 1862 started getting uh, research money, but research in our food and agriculture research. So from 1887 to 1977, as Archer said, they had a 90 year head start. And how did we make it? We made it, as Johnny said, because the sweat and tears of blacks, the toil of blacks, we were, we were engaged in sustainable agriculture before it became popular. I grew up on a farm in eastern North Carolina, both for county. I remember using the chicken manure and the mule manure to fertilize the field and crop rotation. We did all that. The thing is, so from 1890 to 1997, the, uh, we didn't get any research money. Mm -hmm. Then when they started getting a few dollars of research money, it went to NC State in the 1862s. And 1862 gave us what they deemed we should have. We don't know what the formula was. All right. So 1977, with the Evans Islands Act, you know, uh, James Evans was a senator out of Alabama, and uh, you know, James Allen was a senator out of Alabama, and Frank Evans was representative out of Colorado. So they established the Evans Islands Research Program, which means then 
the money for the 1890 land grants started to come into the 1890 land grants. So the money from A&T started to come, in, start to come into A&T. And so over the years, uh, we've always been underfunded, historically over for underfunded. Uh, part because of the Evans Islands Research Act, <clears throat> we spoke at that time, now currently we're supposed to get 30% of the hatch appropriations. And the 1890 extension is going to get 20% of the Smith Lever appropriation. Never happened for 1890 research until last year. We finally had the 20%. In the 2023 farm bill, we moved to try to move to 30% to 40%, and extension from 20% to 40% because of equity. Because over there, think, think it's like you got a 90 year head start, and you don't get state match. Right. All right, you don't get state match. So think how far you behind with low federal appropriation, no state match. And the, most of the, the state governments were funding the ages to twos more than the one to one required match. Right. So basically, they had a 90 year head start. Now we have a 100% match. And that also marries on the, the leadership team at AT. We got a 100% match now. So think about what you can do with double the money. But we still not, I'm, I'm gathered that NC State probably get four to five match. We still at one. We should have get one to one. So the thing is, so uh, through the efforts of uh, Johnny and other our advocacy groups, we were able to get state match. So our facilities have doubled, our research has doubled, you know, we've grown tremendously during that time. So the Evans Allen's uh, Act was a very important for research. At the same time, also 89 Extension, uh, their money came directly to AMG. You mentioned R.E. Jones, you know, with Great State Administrator. By the time that it came, uh, Daniel Godfrey, that he mentioned was the uh, central administrator, who later became dean. I actually followed uh, Dan Gardner's dean of the School of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences. So that's sort of the history of the funding and the equitable funding. Now, the hot topic on the country is diversity, equity, and inclusion. The key part is equity. We're still not equitable. Mm -hmm. So we're still moving forward to try to get additional funding and also trying to fund our academic programs as well. I was dean during the period of exponential growth. You know, a lot of good things to turn the university around, the college of ag around, to get, really getting it more engaged in, in, the, in the state. That's how I met uh, uh, Johnny Jones. That's how I met Dr. West. He's getting out and met the Agribusiness Council, Erica Peterson. Uh, also, it's, it met the uh, Farm Bureau. Uh, I guess so, yes, Daniel yeah, get yeah. us into that one. The farm credit, so basically you had to get out there. You can't be insular to grow. And you can't, and you have to have quality programs to grow. So that's my emphasis, quality program to move it. And that's really the sort of the extent, the uh, extension of A&T's agriculture, agriculture program. And then, you know, Chancellor says it a lot, a and is just not the best 1890 land grant program in the country. It's one of the best land grant universities in the country. Yeah. All right, so, and that's A&T's model by excellence. And suddenly we got the, uh, a lot of quality scientists and the, the programs in place under Dr. Austin's leadership you know, to move the university along quite, quite aggressively. The university now is the largest agriculture program in the country. Mm -hmm. All right, so in terms of HBCUs, the largest mm -hmm. program in the country. Mm -hmm. So we know we're growing, we got the quality to grow, but it attracts, you know, good, pro good program track, good students. But also, again, we could make them that advocacy. Just saying, you know, our advocates like Johnny can say some things I can't say. Uh, he says it quite well. <laughs> but basically, we got to have the program to support it. We just can't be out there talking with no empirical evidence to back up what he's saying. So that's uh, part of the evidence as research in, in the University of Ag in general. Well, Dr. Thompson, I, I must say that um, the growth that started at A&T was uh, primarily um, started by the foundation that you laid. You exactly. laid a solid foundation from which the School of Agriculture uh, could grow. And I don't know if you know these figures or not, but I think the first appropriations in the, the uh, Evans Allen Act was $15,000 <laughs> for 16 universities. 16, right, exactly. 16, right. So $15,000 for, uh, for a university. Yeah. That's $1,000 a piece to do research. research so right. even after 90 years, you got. Exactly you right. Got and, and, and you think about what you're saying. You're talking yeah. about institutions like Prairie U and in Texas, because these are supposed to be formal funds based upon your farming population. So you're talking about a thousand dollars to do research on a state of Texas. The biggest Texas. The biggest Texas is, and they're not to mention others. 
And right in North Carolina, is, it gets a second progression to Prairie to Texas. Oh, we do? Yeah, so Texas gets a little bit few more dollars. <laughs> all right, well, we get, but they How does that you, work? Because uh, the basis is based on the, uh, first of all, the population of Texas. Okay. Then the, then the percentage of rural population, then the percentage of farmers that they had to form it. But that's how Prairie View gets slightly more than A&T. Again, you know, it's, it's peanuts. Yeah. And then during the 60s, it finally got up to 165,000 for all 16 universities. Okay. Then Tuskegee came in, <clears throat> then West Virginia State came in, but the pie still was the same size. Right. Again, with John Jones' effort, with Congressman Clayton's effort, and also Archibald Joe's effort. Forget Archibald, the strong supporter as well. Of course, Congressman uh, Alma Adams. Yes. She was a state congressman when Johnny helped us get the money. Senator <coughs> with Representative David Scott and chair of the House of Action Committee. Yeah. And with uh, Representative Stanford Bishop in Georgia yeah. and yeah. chair of the yeah. Appropriations yeah. Committee. Yeah. Our appropriations have doubled. So we're a 50% increase since they've been in their positions. Right. You came from 15,000 to 80. 80 to 89 million. 89 million. And the FY24 appropriation, we can ask for 108 million. All right, so we're going to push a 20%, 21% increase. Correct me if I'm wrong, I think Representative Fouché. He's on the so agenda. So we right. got two new mm -hmm. black yeah. members. Um, yeah. Recently elected. Right. It's going to be on the ag committee. It's going to help us out. And also, Emma Adams still is on the ag committee. Yeah. She's yeah. called the uh, uh, senior. Right, and, the rep and Representative David Scott is the ranking member of the ag committee. Okay. So but politically, we okay. We just need to but, but, push. but they have to do the homework. Right. They can't go up there and just show up. Right. They got to know what they're talking about and they got to keep one foot back in the state. Right. So they'll know what they're talking about. There's an old saying, Johnny, say what you know, know what you say, but don't say all you know. <laughs> yeah. you know see, 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 Phil, even, even, even with some of our farmers, you guys send these applications out, they want to know all your business. I used to tell the farm, don't tell these people all your business. Right. If you, if you only get so much money, some crops you grow on another field. Go right, right. You can't tell these people all your business. Right. Dr. Ars, yes, sir. In our community of the Bo Ag teacher, in the black community, the, the importance of the Bo Ag teacher, we know these guys have kind of covered what's the importance of that ag extension agent. Yes. But there was another leader because most black folks is in rural areas. Yes. And yes. the leadership basically was that ag extension agent yes. and that vocational agriculture teacher. Black agriculture history, black history, particularly black agriculture history, is really is just a passion of mine. My father was my high school agriculture teacher, Northern Nash High School in Rocky Mountain, and was a NFA member himself and a state uh, officer. The Voag teacher, as they would call it, was really just like it was like a preacher was in a black community. But the New Farmers of America really came out of the National Vocational Education Act. When it was established, there were six black departments of what they call Negro Vocational Agriculture in the state of North Carolina in 1917. And this grew over time. Particularly during World War II, they provided what they call a rural war production training program where they were training farmers in the more efficient use and efficient farming practices and canning on uh, really produce for, uh, food on the, for the European theater of operation. And so the VOAG teacher was really instrumental in that. But after World War II, the VOAG teacher also provided what they call veteran farmers training program, which really is the forerunner of what you now call your community college system because the ag teacher provided <laughs> evening classes and day evening classes, if you will. But the New Farmers of America here in North Carolina, at its height, had 100 chapters and over 8,000 members. And the national organization, when it had its height, uh, until 1965, had over 1,000 chapters and 58,000 members. Can you think about this? 58,000 black farm boys. Mm -hmm. It was because of the NFA that a lot of black youth went to college. Uh, I remember they were saying how his ag teacher, Dad, grew up walking behind me. Yeah. And they were saying in the fall or on the spring of 62, he asked my dad, so what do you plan on doing when you graduate? He said, I guess I'm going to be sitting behind the same you. You see me in the house. He says, no, you're going to Greensboro today. And he's going to the house. Because they were shut from, he said, oh, we'll get you there. And so the black ag teacher was the one that took him there. These are basically our ag education individuals. And as you know, it, within the land grant institution, you have research, education, and extension. And most of the people that were on the previous video 
operated in that venue as relate to the land grant uh, institution. Now, we're, our next group of individuals are professional agriculture that have worked through USDA in many of the great areas that the farmers would visit when they would go to the local office, whether it was FSA, and at that time it was probably called the uh, uh, ASCS, or Farmers Home Administration at that time, or what it is called today, is Rural Development, and NRCS, which was probably called Soil and Water. And at the table will be a great many of these people that have transitioned from those older names and into what they're named today. But probably the one, the person that stirred the drink of all of these individuals and really made it work was Congresswoman Eva Clayton, who was a congressperson who really worked on the Ag Committee to bring about a lot of change in North Carolina. And as a result of some of the things that she did, we had many firsts like Phil Farland, who was the first state director in FSA. James Kearney, the first black director in rural development. Jake Crandall, assistant state director, who also for a term was acting director for NRCS, Charles Whitaker, who uh, worked and provided a lot of programs that were very beneficial to the black farmer uh, here in the state of North Carolina. So we hope you will enjoy this second piece as we uh, move forward uh, with the next video. Thank you. Ms. Clayton, tell us about your tenure on the Ag Committee and what were some of the issues uh, during, during that uh, time period? Well, you know, I think some of the issues are the same issues going on now. It's finding uh, enough resources for small farmers, mm -hmm. and especially for black farmers, um, particularly as black farmers who are trying to get loans and technical assistance to stay in farming. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sad to say they still do, yes. right? I think Commissioner Graham was it? Yes. He came yes. to me immediately after I was elected and said to me in his kind of patriotic way, saying, Young lady, you would do yourself well if you get on agriculture. Your district is agriculture. In my mind, I was thinking, I know my district, I know it's agriculture. I want to do small business and uh, education. But you know, sometimes you need to listen, right? And I did listen. And I chose agriculture and they gave me all three. And I came during the year, of the first time the year of a woman. And luckily I was elected the first woman ever to be president of my class. And that was about 40 different uh, freshmen. Maybe more when you come to Republicans. Mm -hmm. And soon thereafter, the black farmers came to me and said that, that I needed to know about certain things. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I need to give Gary Grant mm -hmm. in my district, and I forgot the others he brought from North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And soon thereafter, he came and brought uh, farmers from all over uh, the country, or particularly in the South. And um, because I had the position of being president of my class, I used that to get an audience with President Clinton. And as a result of that, I think he was saying, I have you know, Secretary Espy, right? Yeah, my guess. The issue was resources, mm -hmm. right? right? The issues was equity. The issue yes. was having opportunities at local levels, the same opportunity other farmers had. That's yes, right. There were new resources made available as a result of that meeting, but it didn't take care of all the problems, to be honest with you. Okay. And so historically, they had been discriminated against. Mm -hmm. And at that point, what they were telling me and what they had a right to, the statute of limitation had been mm -hmm. brought. So they couldn't. And my challenge was in my own committee, agriculture, to be honest with you, they resisted my effort. In fact, mm -hmm. on the agriculture committee, in addition to myself, was Representative Thompson, was Representative Bishop, mm -hmm. and Representative Hilliard, and myself. I was the only woman. But there were four of us who came from the South recognizing we needed to be on agriculture. There was an advantage for our concern. And my, our co collective effort did not allow us to get the extension 
of the statute of limitation removed, okay? Because they needed to have the right to sue the Department of Agriculture for their past discrimination. And I must say, I have to give John Conyers, who, Michigan, yes. yeah, Michigan, who showed us a way. The agriculture community resisted our effort to get an amendment. But John Conyers was the chair of the appropriation committee. Mm -hmm. And agriculture had to go through appropriation. Mm -hmm. And he led the effort or instructed me how to do it. He said, you know, when agriculture come up, you offered an amendment mm -hmm. on the floor. And I asked Mr. Speaker, may I have the opportunity to uh, give an amendment? It became immediately clear to agriculture that that was going to happen. You know what? That guidance gave me the opportunity to make new friends on agriculture committee. That's how the extension to the, uh, the extension of the, the right to sue was given to these farmers. And you know the rest is history. The Pitcher case came yep. up. Yes. And it's still going on beyond the Pitcher yes. 2. And as a result, the first time that all the black farmers in the United States could sue for that. I probably am known to as someone who supported small farmers. Mm -hmm. White farmers when they can come to me too. Indian farmers when they can come to me too. Right. Women farmers when they can come to me. Obviously, I'm given credit for, and there's a, a national magazine called National Journal. I'm giving credit for the Farm Bill supporting black farmers, poor people, and women farmers, okay? Mm -hmm. And also, during my tenure on agriculture committee, we wanted to raise the issue of rural people, period. I became the co-chair of the Bipartisan Caucus for Rural. One Republican, one Democrat. And it was to raise the national um, need of promise of a need of a rule. To this day, I still advocate for rule. Okay? It made an opportunity to see how those of us who live in rural areas get resources like those in, in, in rural areas. I learned from, I learned from the culture for farmers coming to talk to me. I learned about the need of people like uh, Jim Kearney and Fallon telling me things. You have to have a, I tell people, you have to have an open mind to grow, right? And I think I grew into agriculture. And as a result, when I decided to leave Congress, I was invited and given the opportunity to become the assistant director of the FAO. There, I, I, I learned more. What I learned there was really how food insecurity affect the whole livelihood of countries around the country. And we tried to put groups together to fight hunger. But you also, to fight hunger, you have to fight poverty. To fight poverty, you have to fight the whole equity economic. issue, economic issue. So the farms in North Carolina, and many times, Phil, we went up to uh, USDA and we met with you and brought farmers. But all of those farmers considered you as their commerce person, as their representative, man. And that's because of the respect they had for you and the sincere work that you did uh, for them. The other thing is, uh, I did not know that story you just told me. And I think a lot of people don't know that story. Uh, the black farmers uh, went to Michigan, actually. And we met with John Carney. I didn't know where that came from. I now know why we went to Michigan and all of the black farmers met uh, with John Conyers. It was very helpful. Now, she talked about rural. Uh, Mr. Uh, Kearney, tell us a little bit about rural development and doing your tenure. What were some of the issues with uh, rural development? And how did you end up <laughs> getting in rural development? Because you were with Farmers Home Administration. <laughs> well, from Farmers Home Administration to Rural Development Mission Area uh, came about when President Clinton appointed former Congressman uh, Mike Espins as Secretary of Agriculture. Was he the he first black Secretary of Agriculture? And only. And only so far. <laughs> he had the vision 
of restructuring, reorganizing the Department of Agriculture. Well, he wanted to bring all of the farm-related programs together under one umbrella. Okay. And then to leave the rural development type of programs under a, a separate one. So that brought about some consternation on my part, being a brand new state director at that time. I think I had some 420, 425 personnel across the 100 counties that we served. And there was probably some 75 or 80 local offices in, that they were trained. Uh, the mandate was that I was to get down to 260 from 420. What's that, 160 some, some people? <laughs> now, 70 to 75 of those were going to be from program personnel. But there still left me some 90 to 95 people that had to exit, that we had to go through the rent process. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just a downsizing, it wasn't by attrition, mm -hmm. it wasn't by retirement and all that. Uh, we had to, to administer a rent. Okay. After all the dust settled with that, we wound up with programs like uh, community facilities that deals with the Cedars Rescue Squad here. That was one of the things that we did. I don't know that we may have funded that, probably that particular one there. But uh, we had community facilities that dealing with this a building like this, community building, rescue squad, fire departments, uh, hospitals, uh, schools, Warren County School was one of my first projects. We also had business programs. And with the business program, we could reach a little bit larger community size, we were the 50,000 population. Mm -hmm. And we had a housing program, both single family and multi-family housing. There's a number, in my community, I bet you I can count five uh, multi-family complexes that came about under my tenure while I was there as a, as, as a district director. Oh, well, that, so those are the kinds of programs that was remaining with rural development during this period of time. There are two great um, lawsuits that came out of North Carolina. The Baysmore lawsuit, which helped black professionals and uh, helped us uh, move up. Um, and the other biggest lawsuit was the Bigfoot lawsuit. Both of those lawsuits came out of North Carolina and uh, has really affected agriculture professionals and the Pickford affected agricultural farmers. So we have really, it wasn't the Midwest field, it, it was North Carolina that step really, Ms. Clayton, affected North Carolina with these class action lawsuits. Uh, and yes, and of course, when uh, Tim found that suit, of course, you know, he went to Congress and explained what was going on and came back home and they wouldn't give him any loans or anything like that. So that impacted him Keep because uh, he couldn't farm and his wife became sick and had a student at A&T, he became sick. So discrimination is always costly yeah. and, of course, it impact that. The thing we had to deal with is how we're we going to implement programs and put them out there knowing that and black farmers mind that we really discriminated against them. So that's one of the things that I had to face. And also my predecessor, Sam, uh, Sam Poe, the late Sam Poe, it put in place checks and balances so that if a farmer came in to uh, apply for a loan, then it gave him certain things that had to pass. We had to do things timely because of being time and Washington knew about that. But it also made the farmer more responsible because if he didn't bring in form, then he will also be kicked out. So it changed a lot of things you know about receipt for service. When a farmer came in, then he could document exactly what took place and took that with him and read it before he went out. So there was some things we had to deal with. Another thing that I had to deal with is also is outreach. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed that a lot of minority farmers were not getting these programs. So how was I going to do outreach differently? I had been doing outreach and I thought I was doing a good job. Got an award for that. Should I look around, John? I didn't see people who really need to be served. 
So I said, well, how am I going to handle this thing? Then I met this guy. I had the program. He had the people. So we collaborated and went across this state training people on different programs. And, and that changed a lot of things as far as what happened in the agency because folks know how we taught them how to come into the office and talk to the, the program stuff. So a lot of time our folks would go in, they didn't know what to ask for. We had to teach them that. We had to teach them about NRC as program to uh, you and I had to teach them about rural development program. We went to Washington DC and told them how to talk to politicians, what to ask for. Go there, one pocket had a problem, the second problem, thing to go there with solutions. And don't take this wrong, just think like what I'm gonna say. Because I always said a politician did no intelligence test for a politician. <laughs> so, don't mean that in a bad way. <laughs> so you have to take the problem and also take the solution with it to kind of form that. And this is for all of them as we understood. Well, I think you have to assume that we don't know. Okay. And the politicians may not assume they don't know. Um, but lucky for me, I did. Right. And I want to thank you and many people around here. You helped educate me. Mm -hmm. And because you did come with complaints or struggles or whatever, you also came with how you thought mm -hmm. things could be changed, right? Right. That not only happened for, for you, in terms of programs that I've talked to. You know, I've told Erlene, she helped educate me about the whole issue of how you get food out to people, right? Right. And there were those who, and uh, farm credit was big with me, you know, although farm credit is not the best agency, you know they have. But farm credit, people who were in the lower level shared with me things that should be, right? Exactly. That's how I was able to get more credit and loans out there because I didn't know. Exactly. And, and, and people who were involved in at some level of administration of these programs helped me to see how we could uh, take some of these barriers out and make it more uh, accessible to people. So I thank you for thinking that we didn't know. <laughs> now intellectual, I'm superior. But it's yeah. <laughs> But you're right, I didn't know about the program. Thank you for bringing those solutions as well as a problem to it. Exactly. Well, diversity. Well, watch again back that when I came into the agency, we had approximately 1,500 employees back in 1971. 99.5% of those folks were white people. 99.5% of the management were white males. 99% of the staff were white women. So that's what the makeup. And you asked the other groups, uh, who were your peers who influenced you? I didn't have anybody, but I was <laughs> it. I only had one person named Belton Edwison. He was a program guy, and he and he uh, helped me with a lot of things. But I came in the first affirmative action class. We were four blacks, four Native American, four whites. And that's when we started changing what the agency looked like. Now, what I tried to do is I tried to put black people in positions of authority that they could hire, fire, and make decisions. And you know some of these folks. Pat Mabry, she was the first district director, black lady. Carl Bond, the first uh, 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 farm loan manager. Uh, brought in the first Native American to be county executive director. Brought in the first person to be a woman at administrative position in, in our office. Hired a lot of CED. I, I did those things whenever I was there. Looking back, I didn't know it, Jim, that I made an impact. But I think I made some impact on really what was going on. Another thing, state committee, I got to mention these folks. Some folks talk against the state committee. The state committee I had, they put CDs all over the state. Pamela Sharp, Tom Gilmore, John Abbott, they came through her. She made, she put these people in position. And most of them, a lot of them white. But they knew what she wanted, they knew what we wanted. And they change history. So I'm gonna start right there, Archie. I'm gonna start preaching in a minute. And before we go to Jim, before you left out, you brought in a lot of young people. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that and why you did. Well, I knew what happened to me, what I saw. 
So I felt like I had to plant some seeds because I knew I would be leaving sometime. So I started, we bring in these young folks and we train them. Young black folks. Young black right. folks. So when these positions come in to be in, that they will be ready. And now I'm seeing the results of those seeds. You got a lady named Tracy Jones. She's now the administrative chief uh, in the state office for the whole state of North Carolina. She came through me. She was in the, Johnny, she was in the start room. I brought her out of the start room. Very intelligent. <laughs> And I was talking to her some 10 years ago, and I asked her, I said, what do you want to be 10 years from now? She said, I want to be the administrative chief. She was appointed administrative chief two years ago. A guy named James Davis, he is in there now. He's head of the division. So he's heading up the division in the state office. Right. Carrying the biggest load in the state office, this lady, knowing a lot of things. I hope, I have great hope for him for the future. And I hope he can do that. We brought people in, young people now who headed up other departments, county executive records and things like that. I planted those seeds because I want to see them sprout. And, it, and there's no better joy than see these people coming in and take over. And that's one of the things, like I said, when we as black people are put in position, one thing that Carl Hodges and a bunch of Baysmore told me, leave it better than you found it. Right. And if you have an opportunity to bring our folks along, don't run away from it, because a lot of folks run away from being black. Exactly. I uh, can sort of say that we increase our percentage of black employees through the real. Okay. Now, they're saying that that's, that's kind of a hard way to do it. But Make you sure got 90 or 95 people to get rid of. Okay. And Make I, sure you understand that time, real for me. Reduction in force. Reduction in force. I'm sorry. That's uh, it's not a word that you want to learn a whole lot about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> we have to reduce by some 90 employees. At the time that I got there, it said 420, only about 35 of them were black employees. Okay. I had to make sure that uh, those black employees understood the rules of RIP. Okay. And I was able to, during that, educating them about the RIP, um, guide them to be in the right place. Right. Because if you set up an area and that's going to be for a RIP, then the senior people are the one that's going to be the state. The one that came in later are going to be the one that go. Okay. And sometimes we weren't in the right place. But bless God, we were able to save everyone except one temporary employee, a lady that worked in our administrative management, and she was able to immediately get another job better than what she had with us. So that percentage went from 8% to 13.5% just through the management of that group. I, I count that as a, an accomplishment yes. by being able to yes. do that. And not lose a single one out of night. That was tough with the rip. That, that was, was real tough. tough. And you yeah. ask about and, mentors. And tough within I, the law of the rip. Say. Tougher within the, the law. law within the law. Rip. Absolutely. You, you got to stay within the law. You can't yeah. violate the law in order to stay. In order to do that. Right. That's right. All right. Mr. Pratt. Yes, sir. Tell me a little bit about the uh, NRC, some of the history of the NRC. CS program, you and uh, Mr. Crowder. Who are some of the uh, predecessors uh, or mentors, some of the <coughs> historical programs? And I think one of the problems with NRCS uh, particularly has been outreach. Uh, a lot of black farmers field and James, Ms. Clay, they were not participating in these programs. And I know in the last farm bill, it says that only 3% in North Carolina had received program. And that's one of the reasons you worked with me, because we were trying to up those numbers. So give give a, you and Charles, give us an uh, inside perspective. I know we had Johnny, he was with NRCS, but y'all ran him out. But uh, uh, but give us some perspective on uh, NRCS and how it related to our history in black agriculture. See, when it first started, we called the Soil Conservation Service. Mm -hmm. You remember, uh, it was known for there were green trucks, and uh, SCSD were known for building ponds, terraces, grass waterways, 
or work with farmers that way. Mm -hmm. But then it changed the name to NRC. It's called the Natural Resource Conservation now, Service. Let me ask you, I don't mean this. Who was the main person at ANT that kind of made the connection between uh, soil and water and ANT? Mm -hmm. If I had to give an award, I would give it to Dr. Dunn. <laughs> Dr. Dunn always have NRCS, FSA would come, ASCS would come sometime. He would always have those agencies come to a and in a crew. And I remember the way I got started with SCS at that time, that they would come, they had what we call a student trainee program. And they, I got into that student trainee program as a sophomore. And a lot of the soil scientists like John that they had would not have a lot of input with farmers and the public. They didn't hire any black people to work with farmers. Hmm. To Jewish Russell was the first one, then Charles Whitaker was the second person that they put in charge to be responsible for a county, and I followed him. From the county level, you go to what we call the area, like, like the district director. I was the first district director for NRCS in the whole state. That's That'd be significant because every county I went to, it was so rare that I made front page news. <laughs> and when I went up to the mountain, a black and I've got an article of it too. I know, because we were there together. I, that's how I met Phil. Me and Phil was the only black person up in the mountain here working with the federal agent. First, Phil worked with SCS, I mean, uh, uh, ASCS, and I worked with him. I thought I saw a ghost when I saw it. Because I've never seen a black person like that. We read each other. We read it. Right, we did. Because when they put me up there, I was in charge of 30 counties. I made the front page news from all those newspapers. And when I turned the radio on that morning, I was the lead story. <laughs> and I, you know that was kind of shocking. The guy got on TV. It, it was so rare to have a person up there uh, working, and that was sort of the history of you know CS because because there was no you know very few black people up there. It was hard to get black people up there, so I started hiring few black people to come up to the mountain, and you had to you had to sort of have a bond with because it, it was a it was a, I was from, I'm from Edgecombe County. When I started work, I started working in Wilkes County. I ran a completely cultural shop because <laughs> I had never been to the mountain before. They had a, it's a whole different environment. To work different environment. You got to have a, you almost got to be a special type of person mm -hmm. to, to work in that type of environment. So I was, I was the, the person uh, responsible for the total NRCS program up in the mountain area with all those, you know, 30 counties. Then I left there and I, I was the assistant state conservation for NRCS in Raleigh, which, which there was a, there was a first in North Carolina. So, uh, and then you talk about programs, there was a program called Resource Conservation and Development. Mm -hmm. We only had four in the state. <laughs> this was the first fellow Head of the RCD program in the state of North Carolina, and still is the only one that ever had. <laughs> He's the first and the last. When I left, uh, we had ten RCD areas state. I ended up being what we call the program manager for the whole state, which was another uh, new new thing. And but uh, that was that was groundbreaking. But when I started, there was no cost share program. That's what a lot of black farmers miss out on, is cost share program for NRCS. Cost, NRCS got a really good cost share program. Can you explain that to me? Cost share program, anything that you want to do on your farm, it, NRCS will pay cost share. Say you want to build a pond, say your pond is going to cost, say, $100,000. NRCS will pay $90,000. Any, all those crops you see growing, conservation tillage, cover crop, NRCS used to be big in script cropping. All those types of, of programs that NRCS got, black farmers didn't participate right. in all. And I like to commend Arthur for having the vision of, of hiring me to help those black farmers to participate in those programs now. Cause that's, cause I visit a lot of black farmers and a lot of them never participate in those programs. 
even even FSA loans. They never they don't know anything about these programs. So I work with them to try to get them cost share uh, for these programs. And a lot of people confuse NRCS program with sort of water conservation. That's what the problem is. Sort of water conservation district is a state program. The program that Dr. West talking about called the Conservation Stewardship Program. In that program, you can put your woodland or your cropland in in uh, in that program. They will pay ninety percent of all your conservation pack. You see, with people in corn, sort of being wheat, those rotations, you get paid. You get paid to do that. All the cover crops, you get paid to do that. And our block farmers didn't know about that, mm -hmm. so that was a competitive disadvantage. And not only you get paid to do it. They give you an annual payment for it for five years. That's one program called the Conservation Stewardship Program. That is a contract that you have with the federal government that you're going to keep it in that program for five years, and they pay you to do those conservation practices, plus they give you an annual payment. The other payment that a lot of farmers miss out on is cover crop. You can go an annual payment, or you can get into this Conservation Stewardship Program where they pay you to plant cover crop plus give you an annual payment. The other big program that a lot of the farmers miss out on, if you got some land that uh, that you don't want to farm, called the Conservation Reserve Program, where they pay you planting grass or trees, and they'll pay you an annual payment for 15 years, and then after that 15 years, if you want to re-enroll the program, you can do that. That's called the Conservation Reserve Program. And that's a really good program for small farmers that, you know, that you just want to get your annual payment. Archer made a statement. Farmers make, make, make money crop production on taxes and program. And a lot of people miss out on the program part. They really miss out on the program part. But what they see, what I see a lot of farmers is they see this farmer putting this big irrigation system. People irrigation, they don't realize the NRC has paid ninety percent of that cost. They can't understand how that white farmers put that big irrigation in, and I can't get it. But they can get it. You got to know how to go down there and talk to those people in the office. What I see is a lot of black farmers are intimidated in going into the NRCS office. And what I do, I go put them in that pickup truck and I take them out to the office. And get them signed up for the program. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes we have to. Yeah. You got to. Yeah. Yeah, Charles. You know, Mr. Crandall, you've done a splendid job of explaining things today. I've been in the system 38 years and a professional uh, conservationist. I'm even learning from Mr. Crandall today. <laughs> Just like Jake said, uh, he was a student trainee, so was I. And like he said, the reason that we were, I was a soil scientist student trainee assigned to Grayson County, not Grayson, but uh, Davis County, Kentucky, mm. as a soil scientist. And the reason he just told you, because African-Americans were not at that time being trained to be soil conservationists mm -hmm. and work with all the farmers in the county. They were trained to be just specialists working out in the field, classifying soils. And I did that a bit. I worked across the board. I worked with everybody. It worked, worked out very well. Then I was didn't have, didn't have any issues. That's the truth. Didn't have any issues even then. Then I moved down to Rockingham as the head of the county down there. I was the district conservationist. I was in charge of everything. And then I stayed there three years. Then they moved me over to Moore County. Then I picked up Moore County and Montgomery counties. I was the soil conservationist for both those counties. And like Jacob said. We developed a resource conservation and development project, and I was picked to run that project. Like Jake said, there was no black resource conservation development people. So I stayed in there, Jake, for about eight or nine years, I think. So um, during that time, Jake and I still worked together. We it was a that project dealt with developing resources, natural resources over regional basis, over regional basis. 
During that time, Jake and I helped the town of Southern Pine develop a water-based recreation out there at that lake on the Highway 1. Mm -hmm. And we did some water-based recreation down in Hamlet mm -hmm. at a lake down there. And we did a lot of school ground stabilization in its county, Moore County, and all the counties. We did a lot of school ground stabilization. So we did that for a while. And in the board, I had to work with a board from four counties. It consisted of the county commissioners, the mayors of those places, and the planning board people, and the um, school board people from those four counties com combined to get things done. So that was my job. I was kind of like executive director for those for those county for those boards, but I did program work across uh, all across the nation, all across the nation, working in all the states that have conservation programs, working with the people who run those programs, giving them information about the best way to do things. We worked with, I don't know how many of his program managers. At, down in Williamson, we had a meeting, and in Raleigh, we had a meeting. And we were trying to talk with them about what can you do to reach out with your programs to the underserved. Right. I think we did okay, too. You can say that. <laughs> but yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> Let me say that. <laughs> but we, I think we did. Uh, I think I think we had a pretty good uh, deal with that. Phil was there with us, and uh, we were saying, "Please, some of these people out here, they don't even know what you got to offer." Like he was saying, they don't know what you got to offer. So we want you to go out and try to work. We're gonna help you, and we think we made some progress there. Well, but but, 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 but yeah, let me mention one thing about Miss Clayton. Okay, and I think she got one thing about you. Okay, let me see. <laughs> you know what? You know what? Now that we're working this project now, we get grants to work this project. Okay. And she's in agriculture in Washington, and we use the Farm Bill, 20, section 20, 2501 of the Farm Bill to get grant money. And we've been getting a lot of grant money to work with the farmers and do the outreach with farmers that we're doing now. And I think... Uh, it's working very well. And thank you for what you did. And Ms. Clayton, can you close us out? And I know you got a comment. But if you... Well, I really want to appreciate the fact that there was that part of agriculture was so unknown to blocks, right? Uh, I, again, I, I repeat myself, I did not know as much about farming, period, right? But I, I would bet my dollar my husband's deceased. Never use the conservation part of it. Never, never. never use that conservation part of it. Uh, so the fact that you've been able to fulfill what Phil is doing and what Kern is doing to let them, there's a whole petri of programs available that people, and yours is more of sustainability than just the loans and the development of this side, right? Because you got to go knock on that door almost every year. You can be involved with it. So thank you for what you're doing to make the collective available. Well, I want to thank all of you who have come. I, I This has been inspiring. It's been informative. And I want to thank all of you who have been involved in serving. Uh, your service has meant a lot to North Carolina. And thank you for your willing to tell the story. And thank you, Akimha, for having the the imagination and, and the creativity to know bring all us old folks together, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's our, we are delighted to uh, be a part of your initiative and, and thank you all for coming. I think lunch is gonna happen. By the way, you're in um, obviously Warren County in, in Buck Spring, and this is part of the extension program. And when I was asked to host it, I thought, boy, it would be nice to host them. Uh, a part of the agriculture building as well. So thank you all for coming. Thank you again.